so that we might have to hold that thought. I think we can go in. Here's Rachel Reeves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Conference. Thank you. This time last year, I stood on this stage and I made a commitment. I promised that we would get Britain building again, repair our NHS and power growth in every part of Britain. Today, after 14 wasted years, I stand here as your Chancellor of the Exchequer, ready to deliver on that commitment. At this conference, we welcome more than 200 new Labour MPs, members of the most diverse Parliament in our country's history. Labour winning for the very first time in seats like South East Cornwall, the Isle of Wight, Aldershot, Banbury and Basingstoke, in Hexham, Altrincham and the Ribble Valley, and Labour is back in the service of communities that we never should have lost in our port, coal, steel and mill towns, from Bolsover, Bassett Law and Grimsby, to Hartlepool, Rother Valley, Newton, Aycliffe and Bridge Ends, and Conference, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, across the Central Belt and out in the Western Isles, Labour is back in Scotland too. So let me pay tribute to the people in this hall who made that difference. Those who stayed and fought through the hard years. Those who came back to our party under Kia's leadership. And those who joined us for the very first time. You helped change our party. And you gave us this priceless chance to change our country for the better. To all of you, a huge thank you. In this hall, one year ago, I stated my intention that the next time I addressed you, I would do so as the first female Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> Today, conference, you can consider that a promise fulfilled. 800 years the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer has existed. Everyone a man. On the 5th of July, we made history. Every woman watching this will know, no matter how high you climb, how hard you work, how qualified you are, there will always be moments when you are reminded. Some people still do not believe that a woman can get the job done. But millions of women in our party, in our trade unions and in every walk of life beat back those doubts. I am here today because I worked hard, yes, but most of all, I'm here because of the efforts of those who went before me. Trailblazing women like Jenny Lee, Barbara Castle, and our friend and our inspiration, Harriet Harman. And I'm here because of thousands of women, many of you in the hall today, who broke down barriers and defeated low expectations to pave the way for the rest of us. I am a Labour Chancellor because of that collective endeavour. I am the first woman Chancellor because of that collective endeavour. And that collective endeavour does not stop here. It falls to me and to our generation of Labour women to follow in the footsteps of those who went before us, to write the work of all women back into our economic story, to show our daughters and our granddaughters that they need place no ceiling on their ambitions. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. But conference, why is it that the British people put their trust in us for the first time in five general elections. It is because, thanks to Kia's leadership, we left no stone unturned to show that Labour is the party of economic responsibility and the party 
of working people. We were elected because for the first time in almost two decades, people looked at us, looked at me, and decided that Labour could be trusted with their money. That is more than a political choice or a single line in any manifesto. It is about our values. Because we saw what happened two years ago when governments play fast and loose with the public finances. When the prices of food and housing and energy soar, it is working people with mortgages, rents and bills to pay who suffer the consequences. Well, I will not take that risk. I will repay the trust that people put in us. Trust is hard earned, but it's easily squandered. Just ask the Conservatives. They paid the price for their incompetence, their dishonesty and their rule breaking. This is a changed Labour Party, a Labour Party that represents working people, not a party of protest. We're in government today because we changed our Labour Party and we now have the chance to change our country for the better. We've had years of protest and we've had years of division and decline that left working people worse off. It wasn't for the Conservatives just the heaviest defeat in their party's history, but it was the heaviest defeat in, for any governing party in British history. And conference, I can tell you today, I can tell you today that I am so proud that our Women's Parliamentary Labour Party is bigger than the entire Conservative Parliamentary Party. And so where will the Conservatives go next? Well, what a clash of the titans their leadership contest has become. <laughs> the former Home Secretary, who called the Rwanda scheme batshit, and is of course now pledging to bring it back. The former Immigration Minister, who found himself too right-wing to work with Suella Braverman. The moderate candidate, the security minister, former security minister, who says that he acts on his principles, previously demonstrated by backing Liz Truss to be prime minister. <laughs> and then there's the former business secretary, who claims that she became working class at the age of 16. <laughs> but conference, the Tories' failure was not just because they were incompetent or deluded, not just because they put party before country. Though of course, both of those are true. It is because they do not understand the world as it is today. They do not understand the premium on economic stability in an uncertain world. They do not understand that in our new age of insecurity, government cannot just get out of the way and leave markets to their own devices. Instead, the Tories cling to the discredited, trickle down and trickle out dogma that a strong economy can be built through the contribution of just a few people, a few parts of the country, or a few industries. Their ideas choked off investment, opened wide gaps between different parts of the country, 
and it suffocated growth and living standards. We will not make those mistakes. Yet, when their ideas were found wanting, what did they do? They doubled down. Never forget what the Conservatives did. Two years ago today, in their clamour to cut taxes for the richest, they crashed the economy, sent mortgages spiralling and put pensions in peril. And you will hear many things at their conference next week, but you won't hear an apology. No apology for the cost of your mortgage. No apology for crum crumbling classrooms and rising waiting lists. No apology for mismanaging our public finances, degrading our institutions and crashing our global standing in the world. They do not care and they have learned nothing. So be in no doubt. <laughs> be in no doubt. Given the chance, they will try and do it all over again. Only we, only the Labour Party can stop them. So we must have no complacency, a relentless focus on the priorities of the British people and iron discipline. We cannot give them that chance. So let's resolve together today that we will not give them that chance. Now, I know that you are impatient for change. I am too. But conference, because of that legacy left by the Conservatives, the road ahead is steeper and harder than we expected. You don't need to take my word for it. Figures released only on Friday showed another month of record borrowing. Debt at 100% of GDP. That is the inheritance that they left in black and white. In my first weeks at the Treasury, the true extent of the Tories' irresponsibility was revealed to me. £22 billion of spending plans this year that the previous government did not disclose, which they had no plan to pay for, and which they had covered up from Parliament and from the British people. Departments had been allocated money that they were spending, but which did not exist. The money was not there. A £22 billion black hole, which, if not tackled now, will pose risks for years to come. That included more than £6 billion overspend on the asylum system, including their failed Rwanda policy. Almost £3 billion on rail projects. The nation's reserve, intended for genuine emergencies, set to be spent three times over, only three months into the financial year. They were reckless, they were irresponsible, and they acted in that way, not because they believed it was right for our country, but because they believed it might rescue their party from defeat. They promised solutions that they knew could never be paid for, roads that would never be built, public transport that would never arrive, and hospitals that would never treat a single patient. They showed no regard for ordinary working people, and they did not care about the consequences. It was made clear to me that failure to act swiftly could undermine the UK's fiscal position, with implications for public debt, mortgages, and prices. And so I took action to make the in-year savings necessary. We are reviewing plans for new hospitals promised by the Conservatives, but which they did not budget for. We cancelled road and rail projects promised by the Conservatives, but which they did not budget for. And I made the choice to means test the winter fuel payment so that it is only targeted at those most in need. I know that not everyone in this hall or in the country will agree with every decision that I make. But I will not duck those decisions. Not for political expediency, not for personal advantage. Faced with that £22 billion black hole that the Conservatives left this year, and with a triple lock ensuring that the state pension will rise by an estimated £1,700 over the course of this Parliament, I judged it the right decision in the circumstances that we inherited.
I did not take those decisions lightly. I will never take the responsibilities of this office lightly. And I will never take lightly the trust of voters who have been burned too often by politicians who put ideology and party and self-interest above the interests of the British people. And so we must deal also with another Tory legacy. Conference, I know how hard people work for their money. Taxpayers' money should be spent with the same care with which working people spend their own money. And so one year ago, I promised you that this Labour government would wage a war on Tory waste. It has begun. I pledged that we would aim to half government consultancy spend, and we have already announced savings this year. I pledged that we would cut down on the excesses of Tory ministers' private air travel, and we have already cancelled the £40 million contract for Rishi Sunak's VIP helicopter. And I pledge that we would act on the carnival of waste and fraud that took place during the COVID pandemic. Billions of pounds of public money handed out to friends and the donors of the Conservative Party. Billions more defrauded from the taxpayer. More than a billion pounds spent on PPE that either did not arrive or was not fit for purpose. All under the cover of the greatest crisis of my lifetime. On entering government, we found 674 million pounds of contracts in dispute, where we inherited a recommendation from the previous government that any attempt to reclaim that money should be abandoned. The Tories simply did not care, but Labour will not stand for it. I will not stand for it. So, as I promised, we are appointing a COVID corruption commissioner. It could not be more urgent. And I have put a block on any contract being abandoned or waived until it has been independently assessed by that commissioner. I won't turn a blind eye to rip off artists and fraudsters. I won't turn a blind eye to those who use a national emergency to line their own pockets. I won't let them get away with that. That money belongs in our police, it belongs in our health service, and it belongs in our schools and conference. We want that money back. Next month, I will deliver the first budget of this Labour government. The first Labour budget in 14 years. And because I know, and because I know how much damage has been done in those 14 years, let me say one thing straight up. There will be no return to austerity. Conservative austerity was a destructive choice for our public services and for investment and growth too. Yes, we must deal with the Tory legacy, and that means tough decisions. But I won't let that dim our ambition for Britain. So it will be a budget with real ambition, a budget to fix the foundations, a budget to deliver the change that we promised, a budget to rebuild Britain. And my budget will keep our manifesto commitments. Every choice we make, will be within a framework of economic and fiscal stability. You'd expect nothing less. We said we would not increase taxes on working people, which is why we will not increase the basic higher or additional rates of income tax, national insurance, or VAT. And we will cap corporation tax at its current level for the duration of this parliament. Conference, as promised, we will extend the energy profits levy on oil and gas producers to invest in homegrown energy here in Britain. We will end the non-DOM tax loopholes and we will crack down on tax avoidance and tax evasion. That is the difference that a Labour government will make. And we are already delivering on that promise to cut down on tax avoidance and tax evasion. Strengthening the powers of HMRC under the leadership of our Exchequer Secretary James Murray and recruiting 5,000 new tax compliance officers because this government will not sit back and indulge the minority who avoid paying the taxes that they owe. <laughs> a 
and conference, we will enact another manifesto commitment. Because I know every parent has aspiration for their children. And I know the strain that our state schools have been under. This government will introduce VAT on private school fees to invest in our state schools. It is the fair choice, the responsible choice, the Labour choice to support the 94% of our children in our state schools. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. This budget will be a budget for economic growth. It will be a budget for investment. Because today we find ourselves at the very bottom of the G7 league table for economy-wide investment as a share of our GDP. And we must change that. Conference, I believe in a better Britain. A Britain of opportunity, fairness and enterprise. I know that country has sometimes felt far off in recent years. As our growth, our productivity and family finances fall behind. But it doesn't have to be that way. The British capacity for inventiveness, enterprise, and old-fashioned hard work has not gone away. So believe me when I say, my optimism for Britain burns brighter than ever. My ambition knows no limits, because I can see the prize on offer if we make the right choices now. Stability is the crucial foundation on which all of our ambitions will be built. The essential precondition for business to invest with confidence and for families to plan for the future. The Liz Truss experiment showed us that any plan for growth without stability leads to ruin. So we will make the choices necessary to secure our public finances and fix the foundations for lasting growth. Stability paired with reform will forge the conditions for businesses to invest and for consumers to spend with confidence. Growth is the challenge and investment is the solution. Investment in new industries, new technologies, and new infrastructure. Let me put what we are doing into some perspective. If the UK economy had grown at just the average rate of other OECD economy, economies under the Tories, our economy would be 140 billion pounds larger today. That would have provided an extra 58 billion pounds to invest in our public services without raising a single tax rate by a single penny. Revenue to invest in our schools, our hospitals, our police, and all our public services. And that's not the limit of my ambitions, because with growth, we will create jobs that pay enough to raise a family on for you and your children, put real money in the pockets of working people, and wealth in all of our communities that flows into vibrant high streets. That is how we'll make Britain the best place to start and grow a business, whatever background you come from, wherever you grew up. Things built to last and exported around the world are made here in Britain. This is how we'll achieve what we promised, the five missions that will comprise a decade of national renewal. That is the Britain that we are building. That is the Britain that I believe in. During the election campaign, I visited businesses all over Britain, from historic brands seizing the opportunities of the future, to innovative startups at the cutting edge, to high street businesses breathing new life into their communities. Our world leading universities, creative industries, life sciences, tech companies, and professional services. I see immense potential wherever I go. But for every success story, there is potential held back. Entrepreneurs struggling to access finance. High street businesses punished by our outdated system of business rates. Builders frustrated by a planning system which hands power to the blockers. Exporters tied up in red tape by a failed Brexit deal. Too many people out of work through chronic illness waiting for treatment. or Without the skills, training and security that they need to build their potential. And a welfare state that does not always incentivize work. Brilliant young people shut out of the opportunities that they deserve, and whole industries held back without a real strategy for their future. So we must learn the lessons of the Tories' failure. 
We must build growth in a changed world. In this age of insecurity, growth requires stability, but not stability alone. It requires active government, and it requires the contribution of people in every part of Britain, not just a few. Where there are vested interests, outdated practices, or institutional barriers obstructing productive investment, we will confront them head on. Where active government is called for, this government will act. And conference, it is time that the Treasury moved on from just counting the costs of investment to recognising the benefits too. So we are calling time on the ideas of the past, calling time on the days when government stood back, left crucial sectors to fend for themselves and turned a blind eye to where things are made and who makes them. The era of trickle-down, trickle-out economics is over. And so I can announce... And so I can announce that next month, alongside our business secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, we will publish our plans for a new industrial strategy for Britain. A strategy for driving and shaping long-term growth in our manufacturing and service sectors. A strategy to unlock investment, create jobs and deliver prosperity. A strategy to help break down barriers to regional growth speed ahead to net zero and clean power by 2030, and build prosperity on strong and secure foundations. Because when I said that this Labour Party is proudly pro-business and proudly pro-worker, I meant it. This mission... <laughs> this mission for investment, for growth, for jobs, is why in a few weeks' time, this government will be hosting a major international investment summit, bringing together hundreds of business leaders to send a simple message that after years of instability and uncertainty, Britain is open for business once again. <laughs> and this mission is why we will reform our pension system, overhaul business rates, give power to our regional mayors and leaders, deliver a plan to get waiting lists down and people back to work, and forge a closer relationship with our neighbours in the European Union while pursuing trade deals to open up new markets too. <laughs> it's why we launched a new national wealth fund to invest in new and growing industries right across Britain. And it is why Angela Rayner and I have wasted no time in ripping out the blockages in our planning system so we can get Britain building again. You know, within 72 hours of taking office, we did more to unblock the planning system than the Conservatives did in 14 years, including an end to the senseless Tory ban on onshore wind. And conference, we won't stop there. Onshore wind to bring down your energy bills. New data centres for good jobs in the industries of the future. And housing for the decent home that every family deserves. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. If you want to start or grow a business, if you want to export overseas, if you want to build in Britain, but fear local opposition and delay. If you have felt the quiet desperation of jobs, opportunity and investment slipping away, then be assured your ambitions, your hopes, your future will not be held back any longer. I have promised this hall before that what you will see in your town, in your city, is a sight that we have not seen often enough in our country. Shovels in the ground, cranes in the sky, the sounds and the sights of the future arriving. We will make that a reality. Jobs in the automotive sector of the future in the industrial heartland of the West Midlands. <laughs> Jobs in life sciences across the Northwest, clean technology across South Yorkshire, a thriving gaming industry in Dundee, and jobs in carbon capture and storage on Teesside, Humberside, and right here on Merseyside too.
wealth created and wealth shared in every part of Britain. That is the prize. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. And conference, because growth must be built by the many, its proceeds must be felt by the many too. And because of the indignity and insecurity that stems from the broken link between hard work and fair reward, we will deliver on another promise, a new deal for working people. With a ban on exploitative zero hour contracts, an end to fire and rehire, and a minimum wage which takes into account the real cost of living so that last we will have a genuine living wage in our country. For dignity, for security, for growth, this Labour government will make work pay. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. Within weeks of entering office, we faced another choice. We could accept the independent pay review body's recommendations and give public sector workers their first above inflation pay rise in 14 years. Or we could allow further industrial disruption to wreak havoc on our public services. Patients having hospital appointments cancelled. Parents unable to send their children to school. Key workers the men and the women who kept us safe during the pandemic, forced to pay the price for a crisis that they did not create. The Conservatives gave no guidance to the pay review bodies on affordability, nor did they budget for the recommendations they offered. And the Conservatives will deny that this was a choice that had to be made at all. They will claim that it was a viable strategy to let industrial action continue, to let a crisis in recruitment and retention spiral, and let public services deteriorate yet further. That was not a choice I was willing to make. And it was not a choice that was in the national interest either. So I am proud. I am proud to stand here as the first Chancellor in 14 years to have delivered a meaningful real pay rise to millions of public sector workers. We made that choice. We made that choice not just because public sector workers needed a pay rise, but because it was the right choice for parents, patients, and for the British public. The right choice for recruitment and retention, and it was the right choice for our country. If the Conservative Party, if they want to fight about this, if they want to argue that we should have ignored those pay review bodies, that public sector workers should fall further behind the cost of living, that ordinary families should pay the price of industrial action, if the Conservative Party want to fight about who can be trusted to make the right choices for our public services and those who use them, then I say, bring it on. <laughs> public services that we can be proud of once again with a Labour government. That is the Britain that we're building and that is the Britain that I believe in. Let me tell you where I'm coming from. My mum and dad were primary school teachers, and I'm really proud of that. My mum was a special needs teacher at my school, and my dad was a head teacher at a different local primary. I know how hard my mum and dad worked, how dedicated they were, the long hours they put in, my sister Ellie and me playing in our dad's office whilst he worked late. And they had to do that in the face of a Conservative government that in its every action showed that it didn't care much about kids in schools like theirs, ordinary comprehensive schools like the one that I went to and the kids that I grew up with. My mum and dad lived their values and they taught me the value of public service, of hard work, of giving something back to your community. I joined this party because of three words spoken in a conference hall in Blackpool 28 years ago. Education, education, education.
I joined this party because I believe that strong public services are the backbone of any decent society. Because I believe that people should rise and fall on their own merit, not on the circumstances of their birth. And because I believe that we do not have to choose between a fair society and a strong economy. I don't want kids to succeed against all odds. I want them to succeed because they deserve it. Because the odds aren't stacked against them. That's the Britain that I want to live in. Just like every other parent who wants the best for their kids. So I will judge my time in office a success if I know that at the end of it, there are working class kids from ordinary backgrounds who lead richer lives, their horizons expanded and able to achieve and thrive in Britain today. That starts by taking the first steps on delivering another manifesto commitment. Our promise, led by our Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, to introduce free breakfast clubs in every primary school across England. <laughs> Today, I can announce that that will start in hundreds of schools for primary school aged pupils from this April ahead of the national rollout. An investment in our young people, an investment in reducing child poverty, an investment in our economy. And an investment so that in years to come, we can proudly say that we left behind a Britain where the next generation has a chance to do better than those who came before it. Conference, that is the Britain that we're building. That is the Britain that I believe in. The work of change is only just beginning, and the stakes are high. Trust is a fragile thing. We've seen the consequences when mainstream politics comes up short. It falls to us to show that politics can be a force for positive change. Not through words, but through action. Through progress towards that Britain of opportunity, fairness, and enterprise. That is our task. That is my task. It comes with a great weight of responsibility. I embrace it. It will mean hard work. I am ready for it. The British people put their trust in us, and we will repay it. And when someone asks you, does this government represent me? When they ask, whose side are they on? You can tell them. When you work hard, Labour will make sure you get your fair reward. When barriers obstruct opportunity and investment is constricted, Labour will tear down those barriers. When working people have paid the price for the Tory chaos, whilst waste spirals and taxes are avoided, Labour will act. And when the national interest demands hard choices, Labour will not duck them. We will make fair choices. For decent public services and the people who rely on them. For investment and opportunity in every part of Britain. For an end to the naysaying, the division, the defeatism. An end to the low investment that feeds decline. And an end to the easy answers, the empty promises and the Tory stagnation. Conference, you can tell them that we stand, that we will always stand with working people. We changed our party, now let us change our country. This is our moment, our chance to show that politics can make a difference, that Britain's best days lie ahead, that our families, our communities, our country need not look on while the future is built somewhere else, that we can and we will make our own future here. A Britain trading, competing and leading in a changed world, a Britain founded on the talent and the effort of working people. That is the Britain we're building. That is the Britain I believe in. Together, let's go and build it. A rapturous reception there for Rachel Reeves.
being cheered on by the conference hall. The first female Chancellor of the Exchequer and a celebratory tone at the beginning of her speech. And why not? Uh, the backdrop here in Liverpool at this conference is Labour here in this city, but also in government for the first time in 14 years. She'd obviously taken on board the idea of striking a more upbeat, a more optimistic note. But she did spend quite a lot of her speech still pinning what she called that dreadful economic inheritance and legacy on her predecessors, on the Conservatives. But she painted a picture of the Britain that she would like to see, that this Labour government is aiming for. You can see her there being embraced by Sir Keir Starmer, by the Prime Minister. Conference is on its feet. They are delighted, of course, despite some of the bad headlines. But, yes, she was painting a picture of getting Britain moving again, describing how she wants to see those shovels in the ground, that the party and the government is going to be both pro-business and pro-worker and that the budget when it comes at the end of October will be ambitious and it will be ambitious on all sorts of fronts. What we perhaps lacked was some of the detail about how she is going to get to this picture of Britain as a thriving country where there is going to be growth that everybody is going to share in those proceeds of growth when it comes. Let me uh, bring in my guests here uh, for Politics Live. We have Sonia Soda from The Guardian and The Observer and the political editor of The Sun on Sunday, Kate Ferguson. Uh, Sonia, what did you make of the speech? Well, I thought she painted a really compelling vision of the sort of Britain that she wants to see, you know, a Britain that's uh, building again, where there's all this massive investment, where, you know, infrastructure is up and running. So it's very positive. The question is, and I guess this was always going to be the issue with a speech at conference, is there wasn't that much that's new in it. Mm. And in some ways you expect that because she's got two big events we've now learned next month. We've got the budget, which we always knew about, and also she's going to be publishing an industrial strategy alongside it at some point next month. So I expect that that's where some of the details are going to come. But I think if you're looking at the speech as an economic analyst, you've still got some of the same questions. There are some really important measures in Labour's programme. So, for example, in reform of the planning system, workers' rights. Both of those can boost growth and they've got the potential to boost growth, the stability that she was talking about. But you've still got to come back to the same question, which is, is it enough to get the level of growth that um, she wants to see, that the country really needs? We've got very low uh, levels of business investment in this country. We've yeah. had that for decades. She referenced that in her speech. Um, a lot of people would say, well, actually, the government needs to invest a little bit more up front in order to draw in that business investment. Stability, planning reform is, isn't enough by itself. So that's a big question facing Labour. Right, and one of the things she actually lent into, to use the jargon, was actually uh, the agreements that they made. Uh, the pay review bodies made recommendations for significant rises in public sector pay. And then while she was speaking, we received the news, we can probably show you this tweet from uh, your colleague Harry Cole, <laughs> which is that nurses have rejected the government's pay award of a five and a half percent rise announcement by the Royal College of Nursing. I mean, talk about bad timing. It's a kick. It's a purposeful kick in the teeth to drop that right when she's making her first conference speech. It's a kind of big F you, I won't swear on telly, no, please to don't. the Chancellor, really. I mean, I thought it was interesting. She went up there. It was the first time we'd heard Rachel make a virtue of these quite controversial mm. pay awards. I think the junior doctor, Scott, was at 22% over two years. Meanwhile, they're cutting winter fuel pension, um, payments for pensioners. Hugely controversial decision. She's up there defending it and one of the unions, the RCN, yeah, they're not affiliated to Labour, but they've got a lot of members and they're a trade union. And here they are saying, we don't even want your deal, raising the spectre of more strikes. So I think it's a, you know, not, not great timing for Rachel, certainly. Well, I mean, and she said that she was proud of the choice of making those pay deals and it has ended certain number of strikes, but clearly not necessarily for sure all of them. Do you think they've been too hasty in making those sorts of deals with some of the public sector workers? She said that public sector workers deserve a pay rise. I don't think so. I think when you look at what's happened uh, to public sector pay, if you look at independent analysis that, of, of that over the last 15 years, it has fallen behind mm. private sector pay growth. And there are massive recruitment and retention mm. issues, both in the health workforce, in schools, we've got a real shortage of teachers. So this idea that you 
you can just keep hammering teachers, nurses, doctors on pay and there aren't consequences for the services that we use in our everyday lives. You know, she was right, the government had to do something and actually, I mean, she's got a new headache, which is that the RCN have now mm. rejected mm. this pay deal and Labour could potentially face a prospect of nursing strikes. I mean, she, yes, go on, Kate. I just wanted to come in there because if you're going to give the junior doctors 22% over two years, mm. don't be surprised when the nurses come out and reject the pay deal for 5.5%. The danger here is that you are opening the floodgates to wage rises that she's telling us she can't really afford if you if you uh, believe what she says the state of the books are. So that's the danger. It's still striking that Rachel Reeves and every cabinet minister unsurprisingly wants to remind everyone here and everyone out in the country that we're in the mess that they describe with the public finances because of what the Conservatives did, what the last few Conservative governments actually did during the pandemic, post the pandemic, and she says she wants that money back, the money that was wasted on a number of COVID contracts. Do you think that will strike a chord with people here? Here? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, I was going to say, look, I liked some of the rhetoric in the mm. speech, this thing about shovels in the ground, cranes in the sky, channeling a bit of that white heat of... Um, technology. Of white heat of Harold technology, Wilson. Harold yes. Wilson. Um, but look, you know, yes, there was more jam in this speech, but... Where's the detail, right? The only thing she really announced in this speech is a COVID um, commissioner, as you're alluding to. Yes. So the only thing she's announced is a bureaucrat, really. It's, it's not really the the detail that I think we want to see in the Chancellor's first, first big speech. And um, will will this... I mean, look, people are angry about the levels of COVID yeah. fraud. Do people believe the government is going to be able to claw it back? I reckon they just don't believe it. Right, well, there are questions that we can put to oh, Darren Jones, who has, rushed, who has rushed from the hall and sneaked in beside you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when you've got over your fright, he is the oh, Chief sorry. Secretary yes. of the Treasury. Yes. No, you're very welcome. Nice to see you. Um, Darren, we've just been chewing over the speech, of course. Um, one of the things I want to pick up with you is Rachel Reeves categorically saying there will be no return to austerity. What does that mean? Well, we all know what austerity is because George Osborne and David Cameron bought this ideological approach to indiscriminate cuts across the public sector with no real vision for the role of our states in the country in the future. And that came out in the wash as meaning raids on the capital budgets, no investment in infrastructure or public services over many, many years. And that's why we now in government have to fix the foundations that they left broken. All right, well, that's your understanding and obviously Rachel Reese's understanding of austerity. She said public spending will rise yep. under this government. Will it rise in all government departments? Well, you have to wait for the budget for all of the detail because I've got to do the negotiations next week. But ah. uh, you will know that different departments get different settlements depending on areas of reform, priorities for government. But overall, public, rise, public spending will rise, as the Chancellor said. Right, overall. But there will be cuts in some departments. Well, I, I actually can't tell you the details because I've got to do the negotiations but next week. But what we will be doing is resetting the public budgets that we've inherited from the Tories, where they yes. had these unfunded spending commitments in all departments, and we're resetting that baseline and then delivering on our priorities. But the if future. there are cuts to unprotected departments, and I understand why you can't say categorically, but it looks as if there will be some cuts to some departments, like justice, for example, do you accept that will feel like austerity? Well, uh, just on justice, I mean... We know the problems we've got in our prison system. We don't have enough places for prisoners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an area we are going to have to fund and finance because we've got All to right. fix that public service. So there will be areas where we're going to have to put money behind reform okay. to fix those foundations. But so, this is not a government. So what will you cut? Uh, but this is not a government that wants to ideologically just shrink yeah. the size right. of the state. Let's put ideology to one side. But a what will you cut? Well, as I said, I've got two weeks when I get back from Liverpool to go through with every Secretary to of State decide who and which how we're going to carve up the pie for, all, for everybody. But overall, public spending will rise between now and in future years. We'll be investing in fixing the foundations and we're going to be resetting the budgets that we've I inherited. understand that, but it will feel like austerity, won't it, in those departments who do experience cuts at the end of your two weeks' negotiations. That's what it will feel like. No, because it's actually driven by a proper understanding of the important role that the state and public services play in our economy. George George Osborne, when he came in in 2010, said to the Permanent Secretary at the Treasury, when I arrive in week one, I just want a list of cuts. I don't mind where they come from, I just want a list of cuts. And year after year, there was this blind ideology that drove this austerity agenda. You do not get that from this Labour government. Well, uh, Rachel Reeves has said again, the road ahead is steeper 
and tougher and harder because of what we have experienced in previous Conservative governments. Yeah. So those difficult decisions that she's talking about in three areas, on tax, on spending and on welfare at the budget next month. So should we brace ourselves for tax rises, cuts in some government departments and more cuts to welfare? So. The short answer is you have to wait for the budget, oh. but I'll flesh out each of them a bit for you because I can tell you were disappointed with my answer. So <laughs> on tax, we've been very clear that we're not increasing income tax, VAT or national no. insurance on working but people. But there are other taxes we that you could We will honour that promise and we're not going to increase corporation tax and we're going to honour that promise. But there will be other changes on tax as the Chancellor has confirmed and she will set that detail out of the budget on the 30th of October. Spending we've just talked about and we'll set that out in the spending review. And on welfare, well, we now have one in five people who are basically sick needing access to the health service before they go back to work. We're going to fix that with our get back to work plan. Oh. But also there has been an unacceptable increase in universal credit fraud, for example, and we need to tackle that to get the cost of that down as well. What's your response to the news? We've just heard that nurses have rejected the payoff of the five and a half percent pay deal that was put on the table. We've said to all public sector workers that and they have said themselves and they've been striking. Their frustration with the last government wasn't just about pay. Yeah, although this is with this government. With, well, we've just arrived and we've just implemented the pay review body recommendations. But yeah. I'll just finish saying it was about working conditions. It was about investment in their places of work. Yeah. It was about investment in their public services so they can deliver the jobs they came into public service to deliver. And we are a government that is committed to reforming those public services to deliver for them and, and for their patients. will you increase the pay deal on offer for nurses? So we have implemented the recommendations of the pay review body. Right. It'll be for the health secretary to talk to nurses in particular. And we will start off the process for the next round of pay review negotiations in due course. It's a bit of a kick in the teeth, isn't it? Right in the middle of the Chancellor's speech, just as she's embracing Rachel Reeves, uh, the fact that you have made a choice to agree to the pay review body recommendations, and they've rejected it. Well, the pay review bodies are independent. It's based on market evidence. It was a generous settlement. As Rachel set out uh, in her speech today, that was a difficult settlement for us because of the financial black hole that we inherited from the Tories. But we took the decision to find the money to give those public sector pay workers, uh, public sector workers the pay that was recommended. And, uh, you know, I hope that they accept those offers. I mean, you've talked about the negotiations. I read your speech um, yesterday. Yeah, and good. in it, you said, I don't like saying no. And we all know that uh, departments come knocking at the door of the Treasury saying, we we need more money and we have a justifiable case. Are you going to say yes to anyone at all? Is it going to just be <laughs> no, however hard you find There'll it? There'll be some yeses. I mean, we've got uh, a manifesto we, we're going to implement. We're going to set out our priorities for the country. And of course, we're going to put uh, the resources behind that. But I am the check and balance in the system. Of course, secretaries of state want to do more and go quicker. But all of us around the cabinet table will have to prioritise on that within the fiscal rules that the Chancellor has set. I mean, there are calls here, as you know, about the cuts to the winter fuel payment. And we've had one Labour MP we spoke to on Politics Live a week or so ago, Rachel Meskell. She says it's cruel. Sharon Graham of Unite says it's cruel. How does it make you feel? Well, I'm reassured by the fact that our commitment to the triple lock meant that last year pensioners got £900 on average more. Next year, they're going to get nearly £500 more. Pensioners will, at a time when energy bills are coming down, have more money in their pocket on average at the end of last year than they did compared to last year. And in these difficult economic circumstances, it's right that we target the money we do have at the poorest pensioners and the people who need it the most. She says she's sickened by revelations of donations. It grates against the values of the Labour Party, created to fight for the needs of others, not self. Do you understand that? Well, it was for Rachel to, if that was Rachel Maskell, it for is. her to uh, explain her, her comment. The one thing well, I would say is that all of my colleagues in government are working really hard around the clock to clear up the mess that we've inherited from the last government, to prepare for this budget on October 30th. Yes, but she's and to talking start about to revelations of donations. You promised. received a gift, apparently, of nearly £3,500 of tickets and hospitality to the Taylor Swift concert. Was I did. that right? Well, I was offered them. I had not seen my children for the election period. I thought it was a nice treat for them. I confess I'm not really a Swifty. Uh, I went in my suit, as was well known. But I took my kids to that. It was a nice treat for them, and I declared it in the proper way. As you know from my declarations, that's the main big donation that I took, and I thought it was a nice thing to do for my should kids. Should you have taken it? I understand the premise that you've explained, but should you have taken it on the basis of what people like Rachel are saying? It was an evening I had free when I had the kids in London. It was a nice thing for them to do. Would you do it again? In those circumstances, yes. I think what you have to be clear of is about the contrast between doing a nice thing for my kids, where, yes, I get a perk. I'm sure mm. I was offered mm. them because I'm mm. a cabinet minister, mm. but I declared it in the proper way. There's a difference between that 
and when undercover journalists and leaks had to expose parties in Downing Street and corrupt COVID contracts with the donors of the Tory party. Mm -hmm. This Labour Party has declared, in line with the rules, transparently, any political donations that we've received. They've explained how they've been spent. That is very, very different to the cover-ups we saw from the last Conservative government. So you've offered uh, Oasis tickets. Would you take those? Uh, Are you more of an Oasis fan than a Swifty? I haven't been offered them, and I'm, 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 I doubt I have time, so I've got to do all these negotiations for the spending review. So, no, I wouldn't take you them. You wouldn't take them. I mean, no. just briefly, there'll be a lot of people here who would say, increase borrowing, borrow more, forget those fiscal rules, or at least <laughs> adapt them, and borrow more to invest in public services. Uh, look, the, 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 the debt pile we have as a country now is the largest mm -hmm. it's been since the Second World War. The reason that matters is because every month we've got to pay the interest on that. Sure. And last year we spent 115 billion quid in a year just on interest alone. That was more than we spent on many government public services. So you have to manage the balance of debt effectively, otherwise you eat up the money available to pay for, for example, nurses. So borrowing plays a role, especially in investing in infrastructure, but you've got to balance that sensibly, which is what our fiscal rules do. Well, Darren Jones, thank you very much for joining us. Chief Secretary to the Treasury.